to a Boomer Futures think tank. I'm uh, Dennis Domer. I'm director of the New Cities Initiative, primarily responsible for these kinds of things with a lot of help from others. Um, and uh, there are plenty of others here today, which is not unexpected. We only have so much room and only so many chairs, but I can find a few more chairs if you can see. The architecture demands that we not tear this out, but I would if I could, but we can't. But it's my great pleasure to introduce today Victor Rainier of the University of Southern California, Professor of Architecture and Gerontology, ACSA Distinguished Professor, one of about 100 across the United States, a man who has dedicated his professional life to housing and uh, elderly issues, um, author of, I don't know, last time I saw it was eight books. Is it more now? Ten books. I, they keep going I, on. Yeah, if I say dozens, books and monographs, dozens, I, I can say okay, ten. Dozens of articles. <laughs> dozens of articles. He's practiced also for about 35 years. He is not only an academic, but a practicing architect and has been involved in about 400 projects. He's a, a native of Kansas City a graduate of Kansas State University School of Architecture, and also has a degree in uh, architectural engineering, which I believe puts the two together very well at our, both of our institutions. And then later on, a master's degree at the University of Southern California, where he's been professor now for 25 years or so, even longer than Right, 30. 30 years, 30 Not years. Uh, so, Victor's work is very, very important for the kind of uh, vision that we have been contemplating through new cities, through our camp, to our campus village, and he's going to bring to us a number of examples from northern European uh, countries that might give us some ideas about how to better create an intergenerational community that our culture can take, right? What's the balance between tradition and innovation? that fits the American culture. This is not Northern Europe, uh, but we have a lot to learn from them. Now, for those of you who are interested, we have a seminar at 3 o'clock in which Victor <coughs> will look at a lot of examples of uh, um, senior housing in the United States. And then tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, we will have a kind of implement, design implementation discussion here as well and all of you are welcome to come um, if you can. Please come on in, eventually I'll find some chairs for you all, okay? Uh, so without going any further, I turn on to Victor Rainier. Thank Thanks you. for coming. My pleasure. I feel, what an august group. I, I know the many of you in this audience, so it's kind of uh, like I'm preaching to the choir. And I think this may be one of the first times when the two deans of the two uh, competing schools of architecture are uh, embracing one another. Somebody should take a photograph of this <laughs> and in the room. So thank you both for coming. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to talk about you know my favorite topic. Um, so what I'm going to do, I talk with Dennis about uh, what I should say, and then, of course, I'm not going to pay any attention to what he tells me. So I'm going to talk mostly about <laughs> ideas that I think are compelling uh, with regard to um, helping older frail people stay independent. Uh, and that's something that I've spent really the last 15 or 20 years. Much of my uh, research has been conducted in Northern Europe in part because they have the most advanced systems in the world as well um, in, in actually helping very old uh, frail people, whether they uh, have mental or physical problems, stay as independent as possible. Uh, within the community. So I have nine different topics I'm going to talk about, maybe half of which or three-quarters of which come from European examples. And we'll, we'll discuss those, go through it, and then uh, perhaps have, if I really am fast, <laughs> 15 or 20 minutes at the end so that we can, uh, we can talk about what all this means. Uh, uh, so this is really more of a discussion about my research and these topics, but of course they're very important topics. Because when we think about uh, housing for older people, if we aren't thinking about housing for the most frail older group of people, well, shame on us, because that's really where the big major uh, problems are. All right, so um, if 
Dennis, do you want to try and turn the lights off, or do you think it matters? Works for me, either way. So maybe talking a little bit about demographics is a first good kind of point of departure. And this, uh, this little graph, or combination graph and table, tells most of the story, and, and that is that there are going to be these huge increases in the 65 plus population. But this um, also shows you how, as the average age goes up, uh, these, uh, uh, these increases in population increase as well. So uh, not only are we going to see a lot of, uh, uh, of people over the age of 65, 2.2 over this 40 year period uh, times the, the current numbers, but uh, 10 times the number of people over the age of 100. So, so looking at 85 plus, which is really that group of people who need help in, in assisted living, and people who are extremely um, old uh, in our way of thinking about it, that's really, the, that's really the growing component demographically that we have to think a little bit more carefully about. And if we're committed to creating non-institutional supports for these individuals, that's where the really tough nut is for us to crack. Now, the one thing that I always tell my students, because this is their, you know, from 10 to, to 50, 40 years, they're all 25, right? This is their, this is their 40 year career span, right? So I always explain to them that the under 65 population grows by 30%. It's an important thing to keep in mind. So these numbers, are huge, but in comparison to the normal population, this is unprecedented. And not only is it unprecedented here, but it's unprecedented throughout the world. All right? So it's not just the United States that is, that is uh, likely to feel the, the changes. Um, certainly the rest of the world will. And the three countries that have the greatest number of people and the greatest uh, well, greatest number of people over the age of 80, um, and this is year 2000 and 2050 because we're using UN statistics a little bit aggregated in a slightly different way. But this starts to give you a sense of what's happening where we have 9 million at 3% and then we have 30 million at 7%. So that's, wow, a lot of increase in the 80 plus population. Now look at China, 1%, right? 12 million, still big. It's a huge country, right? But look at this. My God. They're going to have the same percentage of people over the age of 80 that we will in 2080. So we're, we're trying to figure out how we're going to deal with this kind of a change, and, and, and they're going to see an enormous increase, partly because of the single child rule and partly because of the way in which uh, population uh, dynamics are. Uh, evolving. So, what do we know about housing and lifestyle and what can make um, your life a little bit more attractive as you, as you become older? Uh, this book, which was, um, it's been around for a long time, maybe 15 years old, uh, written by uh, John Rowe and, and, and Bob Kahn, um, is all about this idea of successful aging. It's particularly good uh, uh, publication, which is focusing on the sort of things that we can do, that we have the control over, uh, that can make our life a better uh, and healthier life. So if we aren't able to pick our parents, which I don't think we've figured out yet, I mean, we do a lot of cool stuff, but we haven't been able to engineer that one yet, what are the sort of things that we can do that can make not only a longer life, but a happier life, a more successful life? And there are, if you, you can read this book, it's 300 pages, or you can just listen to me <laughs> and recognize that there are two major issues that pop out of this very long and, and quite um, detailed analysis. And that is, if we can create context for social exchange, social interaction, friendship formation, however you want to measure it, people interacting with other people, um, sometimes not even in a substantive way, sometimes on the phone, maybe even texting, I don't know. That might work too. I don't think any of the studies have, um, have been that advanced. And if we can figure out how to help older people exercise, and about 60% of people over the age of 65 don't get regular exercise, those are the two most important things that we can do. 
uh, in order to make people healthier, happier, live longer, and live a better life. Two really simple things. So every time we look at any kind of uh, housing or community development, we have to ask ourselves the question, how is social interaction and social exchange supported? And um, if we don't have a way of um, making exercise accessible to people, we have to ask that question too. How do we just do more of that um, and make it work a little bit more effectively? Okay, so we're gonna start with the first uh, topic, which is, um, let's see. Um, which is uh, dealing with the European Service House. Now, I mentioned something about the interest that I have in European models and why I've uh, looked at them, because they've been doing this for a long time. So uh, here are just a couple of examples that I think are, are, are interesting. One, the Hoffier Van Stats for 20 uh, older widowed uh, uh, women. Uh, actually, they, uh, they are the uh, spouses of shipwreck uh, merchant marines. And on the right-hand side, um, the housekeeping for shop, uh, shopkeepers or the housing for shopkeepers' widows in Hamburg. These these go back um, 1731 and 1676. Pretty pretty long time ago, right? I mean, these are they've been around for a while. All of them use uh, essentially the same strategy, and that is to create a housing environment that works for the older person, that allows them to age in place with the possibility of peripatetic uh, service support uh, so that they can stay in that housing uh, for a longer period of time. So this idea of not building special housing for a certain age group or a certain disability group, but looking at how normal housing can be adjusted in order for it to help support people for a much longer period of time is something that has a long history in this part of the world. And one of the building types that I think is really interesting is the European Service House. And it's kind of like, uh, we don't have them in this country, but, well, we have a few examples, but not very many. Um, it typically combines housing, a restaurant, a rehab unit, a home care agency, and a senior center in one single mixed-use development. So um, residents are either physically linked uh, to the service center um, or they're brought there, and they can walk there, or they can take a bus there, or they can take a, a minibus, or they can, uh, can drive there. And um, from that particular setting, uh, services are provided to people who live in the surrounding neighborhood, and also people that live in the connected uh, housing. And, and that housing comes in all different kinds of uh, sizes and types. So this one is a 100-unit project in Homestead, which is near Göteborg on the uh, west coast of Sweden. Um, and the one below is, uh, is a 20 unit, very small uh, project in central Norway, near uh, Trondheim uh, in Malaysia, which is a small community. So in this particular building, there are 100 units. Unit sizes are about 650 to 700 square feet, and the full first floor is set aside uh, for public type services. You can take a meal down here, there's a library here, activity rooms, exercise spaces, everything that you can possibly imagine is on this first floor and open to people who are living in the building as well as people in the neighborhood. Uh, in fact, the, the housing is quite interesting too. There are a lot of aspects associated with this building that make it noteworthy. It's a single loaded corridor scheme uh, which has, uh, these are the kind of one-bedroom units, uh, with also separate balconies. So, so it, it meets this, uh, this requirement of being intrinsically social. Um, there are little places, little alcoves on the outside, closely coupled to the entry door of the unit, uh, where people can kind of hang out if they want to. And, and you meet people going from your unit uh, to the elevator. We know from a research that we've conducted in the United States that these single-loaded corridors are perhaps the most friendly um, type of um, circulation unit uh, configuration. So interesting from the standpoint that they're looking for ways in which they can get people to know uh, one another and to connect with one another and perhaps to develop informal uh, uh, helping uh, relationships and, and friendships. 
Uh, the, the service house in Leisha Tune, you can see there are a cluster of five different, very small three unit uh, buildings, and then there's a bigger kind of common house. Uh, and, and these, uh, and, and off to one side, a nursing home, which is really kind of for this part of the country, the only healthcare facility within probably 50, uh, 50 miles in, in any direction. So it, it acts as a nursing home, it acts as an outpatient hospital, it acts as a, uh, a uh, location really for all the doctors in town as well. It's a very small setting. But if you, if you look at how they've uh, configured uh, the community room, it's got a place to, to eat, um, it's got a place to, um, uh, to, to interact with one another, small little um, setting for individuals to take uh, a breakfast or a meal, and even has on the lower floor a little shop where people can make things if they want to, which is something common in this part of, uh, of uh, Norway, because there's a lot of wood there, and people enjoy making things. So the idea here, of course, is to be able to have a place where people from the surrounding community can come, they can interact with one another, they can see doctors, uh, they can take a meal, they can live a kind of uh, happy life. And the whole presumption of their orientation uh, toward peripatetic support, home care support, is to push as many people as they can back into the community, right? So it's not this idea that, oh, we're looking for people to move. No, we're really trying to, to help people stay as independent as possible within the community. We're opening these facilities to people so they can come and interact with others, so that they can have, uh, uh, they, they can have a good time and enjoy uh, uh, the fellowship of other individuals. But, uh, but the big idea here is that they stay in their own community. Now, if they need, uh, to be nearby, if they have a medical condition that really warrants that, then the attached service housing is an option or a choice for, for many of them. So even though when they built much of this, in the very beginning, 30 years ago, when the service house movement started, and their presumption was, oh, this is for people who are 65 to 72, <coughs> now it's generally people who are in their late 70s and early 80s that are attracted to these uh, environments. Now, one of the things that, that Dennis and I talked about is this whole idea of, um, of uh, multi-generational uh, housing. And um, the Danes are really interesting from the standpoint of how they've tinkered with uh, various kinds of housing arrangements. And this one I thought was a good one to talk about because it's pretty compact and it also is pretty interesting. And it's got a kind of new urbanist uh, uh, orientation to it. There's this major central uh, walkway that runs through the middle uh, of the site. This one's called Gingi uh, Mosagar, and it's uh, in uh, Copenhagen. There are about a hundred units of which uh, 65 are set aside for people over the age of 65 and 35 are set aside for people under the age of 65. Now a lot of people who have moved uh, here with families have had uh, children with special needs and it's been particularly attractive to that population. So probably half of that, that uh, group of 35 are families that are made up of children with special needs. But it's a particularly good um, example of how to create supportive housing um, and at the same time utilizing this walkway as a, as a kind of social connector uh, and also providing uh, help and support in other ways as well. They also tinker with different housing types. So um, in this uh, mix of 100, there are 12 units, uh, two clusters of six units each of co-housing, um, where individuals have come together spontaneously to lead a more uh, collective, um, interconnected um, life. So um, I'll show another example of co-housing a little bit later. The Danes have, have really perfected co-housing in many ways, and what they are doing today is very different than what they did 20 and 30 years ago in terms of how um, they help people to be interdependent, but at the same time have an independent life, which is something that I think a lot of people are looking for. Um, now, this building, uh, or this um, development, 100 unit development, has an activity building in the center of it. Uh, there is a um, lunch program that's available, so people can come here and they can take, uh, take a meal. 
If they are indicated for breakfast or for dinner, they can pick up a meal here or a meal can be delivered to their uh, dwelling unit. This is the first floor which has some uh, meeting room spaces and offices. On the upper floor, it's mostly, um, it's mostly exercise space of, of various sorts. And um, this is their exercise room. Uh, it's important to also recognize that the Danes have had this attitude toward exercise that goes back probably 25 uh, years, 25 to 30 years. It's, it's um, clearly embedded in almost all of their, uh, their housing. So it's not at all uncommon to go to a, to a service house, um, this one I took in 1990, uh, which has a piece of, um, of um, uh, equipment which is set aside. You wouldn't, it wouldn't be uncommon to find this in a rehab room in a nursing home, but uh, located in the, uh, um, in, in the common area, so individuals can actually carry out exercise of all sorts in the common spaces. So it's deeply ingrained um, in their um, sense of what lifestyle is, and also they, see, they feel a kind of obligation to the rest of society by taking care of themselves and by exercising, they feel like they're doing something that helps uh, the whole society, perhaps lessening the burden uh, that they have on the rest of society. Now, in this particular uh, setting, if we had that upper floor, you would see that there is this, ex there is this exercise room. It's adjacent to a physical therapy uh, room, and that is adjacent to uh, an occupational therapy uh, setting as well. So all three of these spaces are interconnected uh, with one another. Not at all uncommon for uh, the Danes, and they've been doing this for 25 years before they had computers to track it, uh, to have um, a way of understanding what the most uh, important and kind of unique exercise uh, uh, regimen might be for, for the individual. And also with the presumption that there are other kinds of equipment, if you have a stroke, and uh, need uh, uh, some type of a uh, setting where you can uh, gain back some of the competency that you lost as a result of that. Uh, this is a particularly useful uh, type of, uh, of uh, room for that kind of uh, need. Now, if you look at these uh, service houses, they have all kinds of other things associated with them as well. Adult daycare is often a common component. This is oriented very frequently to people who are living in the community who have cognitive problems and difficulties. Often, people who are in the, the first, uh, well, third or maybe half um, of the way uh, through uh, this uh, dementia um, or Alzheimer's uh, uh, mental frailty uh, um, circumstance. So uh, they will be brought to an adult daycare center, sometimes uh, uh, with a bus, sometimes uh, they'll be dropped off by a family member and, um, and it's organized in a way that can help individuals stay in their own homes with family members, spouses, as well as um, family members for a much longer period of time. This um, is very common <laughs> in, in Northern Europe, and Northern Europe is not, uh, contrary perhaps to some of your beliefs, is not very family-centered. They have these, uh, these uh, types of insurance programs because the family doesn't want to be bothered with all of this, right? But they have them, and if you go to Japan, uh, everyone who provides housing for older people is mandated, mandated to have adult daycare because they want to help people who want to keep their family members within their uh, family context. So these are, these are programs that have high utility for society. They save us money. Uh, they certainly allow families to be intact. And um, we don't really uh, treat them the way we should. Another service that, that is common in all five of these countries is, a, um, is like a lifeline type service, but arranged like uh, 911, so that everyone uh, who's living in the community and receiving some type of help or support also has a connection with somebody in uh, one of these service house communities where they can um, where they can help individuals with uh, unscheduled needs or where they can manage um, any help or support that, uh, uh, that, that may be uh, necessary at that moment. And, uh, of course, Meals on Wheels and other types of service are, are, are produced. They're manufactured in these uh, service houses and then distributed 
uh, to people in the surrounding neighborhood. Um, it's not at all uncommon for the service providers to get together at the service house. Maybe half of these people, and these are all of the, uh, the people who are m maybe looking out for a collection of may maybe two or three others. They're assigned to other people. These are the, these are the leaders. Um, and they're discussing important cases. The, these would be all of the cases that they have that they're, that they're dealing with. Now, some of the individuals that they're dealing with might be living in service houses. Some of them might be living in the surrounding community. And if they are in the surrounding community, then they're likely to be um, helped by nurses or by uh, nursing assistants that go in little compact cars, sometimes by bicycle, depending on what the development density is, to help them in their own units. And very frequently, if it's a, um, if it's a service house unit, it, you might find a helper who would have a list of scheduled services, maybe 15 uh, to 20 minute intervals, where she's going from, from one place to another and helping individuals. And that, of course, can be rearranged depending on uh, what's needed and, and um, what's required. Uh, these seemed like pretty interesting ideas and um, why would they do it? <laughs> why, why do we do what we do and why do they do what they do, right? It's a very interesting and I think important question to ask. Other than history, they had a, you know, kind of a starting point that was slightly different than, than ours. But let me tell you the dirty little secret, it's cheaper. It's actually cheaper to provide long-term care that way. We know in the United States all the assessments are 25%, 35% cheaper, some people say 40% cheaper. I don't know. It depends on the political background of the analyst, I think. But it is cheaper. And guess what? People want it. They want it. They don't want to move to a nursing home necessarily. Certainly not until they have to. But they would like to stay in the community for a longer period of time. And when you have something that's cheaper and better, it's pretty hard uh, to keep that from happening. Okay. So, um, so there's, here's some other ideas that I think are kind of interesting and, uh, and maybe worthwhile. Um, Anlund voning is a type of housing that sort of says, okay, we've got these very special service houses. They're distributed throughout the community. Maybe we could build housing that leans to the service house, right? You're not living in the service house, but you're living in an adjacent apartment building. <laughs> maybe a conventional apartment building, and it's close enough that it makes it a little easier to, to um, gain support, and maybe you can walk across the street, or maybe it's connected in some way, so that you can go to the service house to take a meal, or to exercise, or to meet friends, or play bridge, or whatever. So this is um, a Berjak, which is in Breda, uh, in the Netherlands. Pretty interesting 42-unit building. It happens to be kind of an interesting building, too. It has a central atrium that helps uh, with light penetrating uh, to the, the front entries of all of the uh, units, but also with um, uh, ventilation uh, as well. And if you look at the site plan for this building, there are 16 units of lean-to housing separate from this building with their own assigned parking spaces. And the presumption is that people can live here in a much more independent way, and they um, have the connection or the linkage to the service house to do whatever they want to. So if this one is a bit more integrated. You could easily find another apartment building over here on the opposite side of the parking lot where maybe 100 people would live and also have the possibility of coming here for help and support and just to spend the day. So this idea that you can create these places within the community that will allow that to happen in a, in a much uh, smarter way is, uh, is pretty powerful. I've been working with the Motion Picture TV Fund for the last three years in, uh, in LA, and they have, uh, th this is the union for all of the people that make movies, and here are all the old studios, um, and they have the, the uh, that's the green stars, and the red dots are the health centers that they have created. This one is, uh, is their main one that they had in the very beginning that they opened 80 years ago. And now they've opened several others uh, throughout the community. And what we're working with uh, them to do is to take these health centers and create 
uh, more full-bodied activity centers so that they are in the neighborhoods where there are high concentrations of their members and also we're trying to talk them into building some apartment buildings that would be conventional apartment buildings uh, perhaps on a universal design platform that would be closely coupled to these locations, these three locations, so that their constituency can move to that housing and can be nearby. So it's got pretty high utility when you think about it. There are lots of different possibilities for, for, for doing that as well. Now, um, this idea of pe keeping people at home is something that, um, that we talk about a lot more than we used to in, in the past. Uh, for, for a lot of reasons. One, um, it's possible to do it, especially with the advanced electronics that are available today. And still, when, we, when ARP does its surveys and it asks people over the age of 65 um, how many people would like to stay at home as long as possible, they get people, like 90% of the people say, me, I would like to, thank you very much. And 80% of the older population with long-term care needs rely on family members in this country as well. So. This idea of being able to help people stay in their own homes for a much longer period of time is really important. And for the first time in many years, we have the electronic tools um, available for it. And with service programs like the ones that I'm talking about, it's still possible to, uh, to create that side of it as well. In fact, the, the home modification side of it is pretty simple and pretty straightforward. It's not that complicated to do. Yeah, you can build purpose-built housing on a universal design platform that's far better and far more sophisticated, but it doesn't really take a lot to make adjustments to um, conventional housing in order to make it possible for older people to live there for a longer period of time. Some places are a little more complicated than others, but it's surprising um, that, um, uh, that, that it doesn't take a whole lot of, of adjustment. Uh, ARP in their surveys say that about 15% of people over the age of 65 need some kind of uh, home modification to maintain their independence. So here are some of the simple-minded things that you can do that don't cost a, a lot of money. Um, we're also involved now in doing much more research to understand how to fit um, the special physiological characteristics of older people and their muscle groups and so forth to um, to the very simple rooms of the bathroom and the kitchen, which are the two that we really spend the most time uh, thinking about. And Toto, um, the people that bring you those expensive toilets, um, have uh, research uh, facilities throughout the world. And they're very interested in this. This is one in Tokyo where they're working with um, a whole series of, um, of researchers in developing standards for toilet um, and bathroom designs and accessible fixturing, um, as well as uh, kitchens as well. So there's a lot of people out there thinking about this from a new uh, construction uh, perspective. And th these sensory technologies are getting better every year. When they first started maybe 10 or 15 years ago, it seemed like all of the high-tech companies were in search of how to figure out how to sell their gadget, gadget whatever, their little thing that they had invented. Now there's more of a, uh, of a kind of uh, blending or mixture of this uh, technology with the actual needs of, um, of the older person. And we're seeing all kinds of really interesting demonstration projects that are popping up with motion uh, detectors and <coughs> pendants and pressure pads and uh, all, all kinds of external monitoring devices. It's going in a really good and positive uh, direction. So it's making it possible for people to stay at home for a long period of time. This is kind of interesting. I know when um, I was, I've been working with the one at Georgia Tech, and what they told me was that they had all of these older people who were very bothered by cameras, and the cameras are all located about where that motion um, sensor is located, up high. And when they move the camera from up here to down here, it solved the problem. <laughs> no one was concerned, because they just, you know, we're not worried about their legs as much as they were the rest of their body. So sometimes it's kind of simple little adjustments like that that solve a problem. It goes away. It's like, oh, you, know, you want to monitor me that way? Fine, no problem. I don't have a problem with that. But yeah, I do have a problem if you want to photograph me every day walking around my, my unit. So we're learning stuff. We're understanding what older people are looking for. We're trying to figure out how to tie it to their own 
patterns of behavior so we know what is kind of uh, uh, out of the ordinary. We're looking for ways in which it can be connected more directly to family members who are the ones that care the most and, and perhaps uh, are the ones that are going to be the most uh, interested in, in uh, monitoring it or occasionally monitoring it. So robots, what can I say about robots? We've been talking about robots for a very long time. Um, I just discovered that R2-D2 now is 30 years old. Don't know if you know that or not, 1983. So um, robots have come all the way from everybody thinking it was going to be some kind of R2-D2 that does things for you, a personal robot, to um, either replacing your body parts, which is something that's now very common uh, in terms of thinking about how we're going to solve all problems, much of it coming out of the Iraq and, and um, Afghani uh, conflicts that we've had to the to the this idea of an exoskeleton, kind of like Iron, Iron Man, right? That you're going to have some thing that goes around you and supports you and helps you exercise and gets you from place to place, and um, and in a way builds mus muscle tone as well, because that's part of the part of the problem. So that's probably going to happen, I would think, in another. I've been saying in another five to ten years for a long time, but. I think we know it all. It's just a question of a actually getting uh, uh, people to implement it in a, in a much uh, more um, tough-minded way. There are lots of problems with this technology, uh, but uh, most of them are not problems that would have stopped it from being implemented. They're just like, I don't know, bumps in the road rather than uh, major kind of conceptual uh, problems. And the other one that's kind of interesting is uh, Beacon Hill Village. Does anyone know about the intentional communities? Okay, so that's good. Um, uh, Beacon Hill, I spent a year there, or spent a day there about uh, four or five years ago, I guess, just um, spending time with them and looking and seeing what they're doing. This is um, the kind of uh, grandfather of all uh, intentional communities. Started in 2001 in Boston designed to help people stay in their own homes uh, for, for a much longer period of time. There are now probably close to 100 of these uh, intentional communities that are in various stages of, of development. The most important components, though, and they have lots of com components associated with them there. This is one in Beacon Hill, which is, uh, which is a kind of urban uh, neighborhood in Boston. Um, but uh, a lot of it is, a, is about how to have a more social setting. But what is, of course, is most important is transportation and home care. Those are the two services that, uh, they, they, uh, that they really have to resolve. And if they can't do that, if they can't deal with these two, well, they're just kind of worthless as far as I'm concerned. They're nice, but you, know, you can go to the library and, and join a book group if you want. Lots of resources in the community. But, it's hard to find people who will vet transportation and home care and negotiate discounts and all of that sort of thing. And this is really important. And they're doing a good job, uh, although it's uh, very complicated and difficult. And uh, this is a grassroots kind of movement in the United States, not taken over by any particular group uh, from a public perspective, but it's certainly one that has uh, uh, achieved a lot of recognition and a lot of interest. Now, of course, they've been doing it in Europe for about uh, 30 years, but this is well organized, which is a group that has 110 uh, different kinds of uh, home care services working in. This one also happens to be in Breda as well, working in those uh, neighborhoods and funded uh, by the uh, uh, by the uh, agency that provides housing, uh, subsidized housing and and uh, market rate housing in in Breda. They, they also are doing other things as well. This project in um, Havavogan, in Skydam, uh, uh, called Havavogan, is, um, is a very, it's actually a, this is the newest building on a campus that's maybe 100 years old, very popular. And so what they have negotiated with people who are on their waiting list is, uh, is volunteering to help other people. And you, and you um, bank hours like you would in a frequent flyer program, and you can use them. You can or you can give them away to other people if you want. So they're, they're looking for ways in which they can take uh, volunteer help and support and transform that in a way that, that people can look at and say, oh, this is really something that can benefit um, me and benefit my friends later on. So dementia 
is something that we're seeing a lot of uh, interesting um, explorations of. Uh, I remember 15 or so years ago, people, when I would talk about um, the idea of deinstitutionalizing de dementia in small group homes and, and uh, these activity of daily living clusters that are common now all over the world, but certainly back then uh, in, in Denmark, uh, people would say, oh, gee, you can't do that. It's not possible. They have to be in a nursing home, right? So, no, we've proved that that's not correct. And uh, so we're seeing a lot of these... Uh, these ideas uh, emerging as well. And this is an area, by the way, that's not going to go away. We haven't quite figured out how to deal with dementia. It's going to be possible for us to deal with people who have uh, uh, physical problems, but not, not dementia. This one's with us for, for a while because all the drugs we're looking at, we're going to find a cure to cancer, maybe even a cure to extending aging to average age 120 before we figure this one out. This one's far more complicated. And almost every medication we have screws up your liver and kills you <laughs> before you mention that. So um, I don't think it's going to happen tomorrow. It's probably not going to happen knowing how the FDA uh, works for at least a decade or longer. So it's something that we have to think about, and this idea of small group clusters is probably the best one uh, so far that we've been able to come up with. And, and you see it in other cultures all over. Um, Oh, we were talking a little bit about uh, dimension daycare. This project in uh, Kyoto has a first floor that's daycare and then two nine-unit dementia clusters on the upper floor in a way that's uh, specific to some of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, stylistic uh, treatments of um, Japanese housing as well. So um, this is the Ron Sandush uh, on the outside. Um, of, of Stockholm, you know, the perimeter, one of the uh, suburbs, and uh, you can see here they've uh, transformed what is a kitchen uh, and a nurse's station uh, into one kind of place. So it's an older person who's being helped, or who is is actually helping to uh, create a meal, uh, or helping with the, the meal production <coughs> process, and, and all of the medications and all of the um, information that's utilized uh, in order to maintain uh, the drug regimen and the, and the kind of lifestyle regimen of these individuals is also in the same room as well. So not all in common for us to see how all of this is being kind of uh, mushed together. This is an interesting building as well. And uh, this, if you ever get a chance to go, there are two buildings that I would suggest that you go to. This one uh, called the Hafe. Um, dementia Village and Vase in the Netherlands, fairly close to Amsterdam, and another one uh, that I'm going to show a little bit later, uh, closer to Rotterdam. So you can fly into to the airport uh, in the Netherlands and see both of these uh, in, in a, a jam-filled filled weekend. But 159 um, resident one- and two-story building, which looks very solid-edged from the outside uh, perimeter. On the inside, there's six different courtyards and I said there are 15 group clusters, it's actually 23 group clusters that have between six and seven residents each. And, and they're sliced into different groups, right? So these are all of the cultural groups. In other words, they've been able to figure out how to uh, give, um, how to custom fit the program for individuals with these particular backgrounds. So the big idea is to try and see if you can find individuals that have a shared background so that they can live with one another in a perhaps more satisfactory way. And sometimes living in a center or, or a cluster for dementia is complicated, so it's useful if they share some uh, of the same kind of uh, background interests and desires. And uh, they've also looked for ways in which they can custom fit the interiors. And this is from the uh, group of individuals from Indonesia and there are colors that they have selected uh, for, for that uh, small group cluster. Uh, this is the, uh, the gauche, which is an upper middle class group and has its own set of colors um, as well. So there's an interest here in um, also leading a kind of ADL um, uh, activity of daily living lifestyle. So they have a grocery store that's located on the site and um, and a caregiver will go with a resident. Uh, they'll pick uh, groceries, 
uh, based on the menu that has been um, that, that's been negotiated, and they'll bring them back and and they'll cook them for for the group. So the the big idea is to try and make all of this mo much more normalized and connected to the kind of life that most people would have. So I'm not sure anyone's going to go out and build 160 person <laughs> development like this, but these ideas of looking for commonality in, in clustering individuals and the idea of trying to figure out how to develop um, a um, activity of daily living uh, strategy is really super important. The other thing they do here, which I think is very clever, is every week they have about 22 different activities. And those activities take place in different uh, venues in the community. And of course, people who are interested in music, let's say Bach, right? they come from the universe of 159 people. They choose from that universe, not from those 23 clusters maybe there are five or six people distributed that happen to like Bach, right? So those are the individuals that come to the music session that deals with Bach or, or Beethoven or Mozart or whatever. Um, same thing is true with uh, card playing and uh, certain kinds of uh, peanut, uh, peanut or, or other uh, types of um, uh, card games or activities or even uh, different regimens like snooze one, which is something that is uh, a kind of therapy that uh, is common there as well. So the idea is that you, you choose people uh, for the small group cluster who can get along with one another and maybe more easily communicate with one another in spite of the fact that they have dementia. And then you serve them by uh, connecting them with things that they have great passion for, things that they still have an interest in or maybe even have enough competency to deal with. Uh, and you're not just saying everybody in this group of seven goes. It's uh, the whole community has a chance to uh, self-select for that. So these are kind of interesting ideas that I think have um, um, lots of uh, possibilities. I'm a very strong believer in co-housing, uh, and it's partly because I like the idea of how friendships are reinforced in co-housing arrangements and how mutual helping behaviors um, uh, are uh, supported or are um, in, in a way encouraged in order to have a more self-sufficient community. There are lots of different new um, arrangements or new versions of this that are much less cult-like than what we used to see in Denmark 20 or 30 years ago where you moved into a co-housing setting and you kind of cut all your ties with the rest of the community. Now there's much more of an interest in moving here and having friends and affiliations and connections and relationships and still maintaining all of those other connections that you've had uh, throughout your life as well. So this is a really beautiful project called uh, Ekebagen. Um, it, it's also uh, one that has an interesting age range from 55 to 80. About 40% of the people, when I visited it, which was three years ago, about 40% of the people were working here, about 80% are couples. It's a very interesting set of ideas about architecture put together in, in a kind of kit apart way. Uh, where they're working with a 50 foot by, by I think it's uh, 16 uh, feet wide and it goes from 12 feet to 16 feet in height, uh, these, uh, these, these kind of extruded uh, elements that are produced and then they make all kinds of adjustments to them to slice them up so they fit the lifestyle needs and interests of the individuals that are, that are living there. So it's a kind of an interesting idea about architecture and also an interesting way to uh, create uh, something that's quite, uh, it's a beautiful site too, there's a forest on one side and then a lake on the other side and, and the possibility of walking and the back sides of some of the units are embracing the, uh, the landscape as well, really quite uh, lovely in many ways. Okay, and intergenerational housing, something that is of interest to um, uh, to many of the people who are sitting in this room. This is one uh, project from Finland, and it's kind of interesting in Finland and, and in a lot of these Northern European uh, countries, people who take care of older people and children very frequently are sitting in the same room, right? They're both working for the same county agencies. So it's very easy for them to kind of talk with one another. So it's not at all uncommon to find these kinds of projects. This is a daycare center for children and this is uh, three clusters of five units each of elderly housing. 
In this project, there is a there is a uh, a service center, a lean-to housing project, maybe eight stories, and then um, a daycare center for children and, uh, and and a playground that's linked or connected to that. So it's kind of natural, and it happens in a way that uh, allows it to be um, uh, very easy, uh, easily um, overlapped. Um, the, 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 there's been a whole movement in, uh, in Denmark uh, to develop new, uh, very small clustered housing arrangements for extremely frail people and people with dementia. A little like our greenhouse movement that's occurred here in the United States. Do, how many people are familiar with the greenhouse? Okay, yeah, a lot of people. Okay, so um, so this is just a little bit better architecture, I think, and a little more interesting. We're going to see these kinds of examples here as well, but um, but this particular project is, and I'm going to show you two, but very quickly. This was done in April of 2005. Uh, there are five houses here, and, and and you can see an entrance is is this piece right here. Uh, two quarters that uh, there's a there's kind of an entry uh, corridor and then two quarters with uh, one single loaded and one double loaded uh, with units on both sides and then a big room where there's a kitchen uh, and food preparation space a large dining room area and a, and a, and a little uh, uh, living room uh, space as well so if you see this is kind of what it looks like in a larger scale here's where the food preparation takes place here that's where that big table is, over here, and here's where the small uh, living room uh, area is uh, over on the other side. There are five of these houses, three are, are, have nine people, and two of them have ten people, so altogether there are 47 units. Average age here is about 83, and the length of stay is about two and a half years. And about a third of the people uh, have dementia, uh, and about a third are in wheelchairs. So. Uh, pretty physically frail and also uh, mentally frail uh, group. And you can see kind of interesting skylights up above 12 foot um, ceilings, so lots of possibilities for light to enter the public spaces and also the quarters as well. It's got um, what they call a livable uh, milieu, which is their idea of how um, food can be uh, the, they, they, they order the food instead of going to the grocery store, although there is a grocery store about 600 yards from this place, so they could conceivably walk there if they wanted to. Um, but, um, but they order the food. It's, um, it's prepared um, in front of everyone uh, in, a, in a very public way. This is a, a counter, a food preparation counter that goes from 26 inches to 46 inches, so people can be involved in helping with the food preparation uh, process as well. And um, it costs maybe about 10% uh, to 15% more than conventional food preparation work. The, the, the Danes have done a good uh, amount of work looking at the kind of cost benefits of this, and of course, um, it's also a much uh, uh, better uh, kind of environment. These small scale environments tend to be more friendly, much more family friendly, much more of an opportunity for personalized care and assistance. Uh, we don't know a whole lot about it, but we do know that uh, much of, of the analysis that's been conducted has shown us that it's, uh, that it's got lots of positive benefits. So the bathroom's pretty straightforward. Shower, toilet, uh, sink on three different walls. People are moved, uh, especially if they're physically frail, from the bed uh, to either a shower chair or a uh, wheelchair. And, and can be moved to this room, um, and this can be uh, arranged so that it goes right over the top of the commode as well. So it makes it really easy to uh, help in this arrangement. Only one caregiver is necessary to make the transfer, so it's, uh, it's also not that labor intensive. And here's another example. That one is a corridor scheme. This one is what we would call the Osmond plan. That's a common plan that was developed at uh, the Philadelphia Geriatric Center where, where all of the doors to these units, and all the units are 370 to 375 square feet, open onto a kind of common uh, central area. Dining table, activity space, kitchen, open atrium so that you can see into the atrium, living room, covered porch, outdoor patio. But again, it's sociophital. It has a tendency to 
kind of orient to the center so people interact with one another a little bit more effectively. And this is another plan. It's also got a lot of benefits. So you can see, here's the atrium, this space. This table is this one right here. You can see another table in the back here. So um, tends to, uh, to work very well for, um, for, as I was saying, because the scale and the personal nature of the place makes, a, makes it easy to connect. And in all of these settings, the new nursing homes that they're doing in Denmark, they're mixing uh, uh, people with dementia with very old, frail people. Average lengths of stay here are about two years or two and a half years. So they're not quite end of life, but you know, dangerously close to that. Uh, and uh, also, they're, they're individuals who they've already spent a lot of time and energy thinking about how to take care of them in their own homes. And these are people that want to live together for a good reason. Maybe they have a chronic illness that really requires, uh, or maybe they just feel insecure and they want to be uh, a little bit more closely coupled to, uh, uh, to, to help and support. Okay, so. Now, I need to have somebody up here to change this to the next one, and we're going to, no, that's what it was like when I started. <laughs> that way still in a lot of places, unfortunately. Yeah, so we'll get number two here. All right, so the next two uh, we're going to talk about, I think, are the two most important ones, and probably the next one's the most important one, and that's this... Uh, yeah, that's it. Perfect. Um, these are, okay, so we had the service houses. Those were pretty interesting. They had all kinds of positive benefits. Again, linked to home care, worked really well. Uh, so the Dutch, maybe 15 years ago, started asking the question, maybe we can just take care of people until they die. <laughs> Why do we have to move them from place to place? Why can't we just sort of deal with, uh, uh, with uh, one place and have it adaptable enough so that we can change the environment if it's needed, big enough so we can move stuff in and out, and also change the uh, service support system so that that works for, for individuals. So they called these apartments for life, they actually call them Lavenslope Boston Deej, or um, you know, Dutch is like Germans, lots of words that are all pushed together. Uh, what that means is age-proof uh, dwellings. And, um, and like I said, ultimately probably it's only dementia residents that are at risk, but most of these new models have small group clusters for people with dementia that are integrated into the model as well, as well as uh, daycare. So very clever and very uh, smart in terms of how they, they go together. This is the first one that was done in uh, Rotterdam, downtown Rotterdam, 17 years ago. I've been back to this housing project every two to three years I go back um, and have monitored it. it. It has 195 units, 250 people, or a lot of people that are married that are in these uh, settings as well, or, or people that are living as couples. And uh, probably, you know, it's a long time, uh, 17 years. Probably we've seen, I don't know, maybe not 1,000, but, but, but maybe 500 to 700 people move through this system. Okay, it's 55 plus. The original one was a third 55 plus, a third uh, indicated for nursing, and a third indicated for assisted living. Okay. So um, it's got a uh, it's got a, ter a service um, a floor open to everybody in the community. You take an escalator to get up there, um, and um, again, uh, based on this whole idea that people can stay there uh, for as long as they as they want to. So the atrium, if you're on the inside of the atrium, it looks a little like a shopping center, uh, you know, for lack of a better way of characterizing it. There are all kinds of activities and spaces. This is a big koi pond that's located in the center of it. It's got, uh, it, it's got a movable uh, set of canvas shades that help with uh, daylighting. Uh, the, uh, the, the roof also opens up so that you can get natural ventilation as well. And this is what it probably would look like at any one time, let's say at 12 o'clock when everybody's taking a meal. A lot of people are here too. Um, age range is 80, or pardon me, 55 to 96. <coughs> and uh, it, it's got, uh, uh, the focus is really on, in this particular model, is on um, 
uh, the provision of a nutritious and um, and high quality, uh, reasonably priced uh, meal. And uh, the, each of the units have their own uh, full kitchen, so this is kind of a discretionary um, meal. And part of the big idea here is to encourage people to do as much as they can for themselves so that we're not taking away competency, we're placing them in a context where they can use whatever they need in order to be as independent as possible. And of course, this is the Netherlands, so you'd have to have a bar, which is <laughs> like standard operating equipment here, as well as a cafe. Uh, so it's a very uh, convivial and fun place to be. And if you show up, you find residents and neighbors and family members and staff and volunteers and workers in the surrounding community come in here and, and, have, uh, and have lunch as well. So very interesting from the standpoint of how it's, uh, how it's assembled. Now, what makes it extremely interesting is that about 30% of the people here are couples. So it's a perfect place. If you have a spouse who has a problem, a major problem, and you're completely competent, yeah, it's hard to move into assisted living with your spouse when, when he or she is in bad shape and you're okay. But in this setting, you're moving into an apartment where you're drawing down on a collection of services that are needed in order to support your lifestyle, right? Very, uh, very comfortable and very attractive uh, to couples. This use it or lose it philosophy is all about trying to encourage people to help others as well as do as much as they, they can for themselves. So they, uh, they have in this particular building uh, 100 active volunteers, a third of which come from uh, within the uh, population itself. And of course they have care coordinators that assess individuals and make certain that they don't do things that they probably shouldn't uh, be doing that are beyond their capability. Uh, but the, the focus or orientation is toward um, under support rather than over support. And that's a pretty interesting idea. And it's common throughout Northern Europe. It's let's not take away things. For people. They, they even have funny terms. To, one, one term is uh, I help with my hands in my pockets. And I don't know, it's got a, a Dutch like 12 syllable. <laughs> label for that, but whatever. But I, I'm helping with my hands in my pockets, which means that I'm helping people, but I'm not doing things for them. I'm encouraging them to do as much as they can for themselves. So this, uh, this big idea of helping people to be as, as able uh, is really, um, really what makes this setting work quite well. And if you look at the people that are here, there, it is kind of amazing. You, you see people who are, who um, need a stretcher bather to take a a shower because they can't stand. Uh, these are people who have uh, have lost a, a lot of ability. So the typical unit's about six, seven hundred square feet. Kind of interesting. It's in one of my books. If you're interested in looking at it, a central a bathroom, which is a um, a room that's uh, solid and has uh, uh, has it's like a European shower uh, space. Two doors, so it's relatively easy to get in and out of. A separate individual uh, bedroom and living room and even a small place where a caregiver or a family member can uh, can spend the night as well. So pretty interesting little plan and seems to have worked quite well. So another project, this one is in um, Belfoven, um, which is a little bit closer to the Belgian border. And this is a fairly new one. This project was, uh, was completed um, in 2005, I believe, 2006. So um, again, it's mixed use. It's condos, and uh, condos are located here, here, and here, uh, and uh, rental housing. And it's also got a combination of uh, subsidized units, uh, market uh, uh, rate units, and then these owner-occupied units as well. So condos, 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 and then four stories in, a, again, another atrium uh, kind of plan where all of these are openable for, for ventilation as well in the center. And, um, and about a third of the 113 units here um, are uh, provided uh, for uh, people who are in the social housing um, category. So they're, uh, they're actively sub subsidized. Each of the, the way it works in, uh, in um, the Netherlands, each of these projects kind of stands on its own. 
So the condo project, it's all developed by a nonprofit developer that's 100 years old in this part of the country. Uh, so the, the prices that are associated with the condos, the profit for that goes into a sinking fund, a little kind of Robin Hood fund that also helps to then subsidize the rest of the housing itself. So it, it, um, it's self-supporting in that regard. And, and of course the developers are given, uh, are, are given all kinds of kudos um, and more support if they create a project that supports a lot of other people, um, like it should. So very interesting from, from that perspective as well. If you look on the inside, you can see one, the north side is four stories, the south side is five stories, so light, north light comes into the atrium. These can be opened or closed depending on what the temperature is like. Could use a little bit more plant material, I think, but whatever. This one also has a preschool uh, that's located um, at the base of uh, the two condo uh, units. So that uh, provides the, the possibility for, for kids in this uh, um, uh, newly, <laughs> newborn stew, four years old, to also be part of the scene here uh, as well in a walking club that, that you can check out as well. Uh, the interiors are all designed on this uh, universal design platform, quite different from the condos versus the uh, rental units. A pretty uh, good size units. The, this is the kitchen that opens on to the main uh, shared um, atrium space as well. In this particular project, they don't provide food for people. This is kind of an interesting idea. So some of these do and some of them don't. You know, in the United States, we have a tendency to provide food because we make money on food. Very little secret, right? Food is like uh, part of the bottom line. So, um, so here, uh, there is a grocery store, which is manned uh, and, and personed, I guess, <laughs> with 14 volunteers that live there as well. And uh, there's a cafe uh, where people can take morning and afternoon coffee, and there's also closely coupled to that a space where all of the food comes in and is then redistributed to people who are indicated uh, for meals. Okay? So this is a project that's fairly new. Um, the typical resident might be 65 to 70, I think, uh, at this stage. I think they have 15% of the people that are taking some kind of help or assistance, so not a lot. So it's a beginning stage of one of these uh, uh, Apartment for Life uh, uh, projects. So um, what else do they have that's kind of interesting? They have, um, this is the old system. They've now replaced it with a much more modern uh, and um, slicker um, telemedicine system. So this is connected to the, the first floor where you would find um, nurses and also um, uh, the, their system for medical care is, is uh, quite um, interesting and it's so um, multi-layered. So you can, uh, you can actually use uh, this, a cell phone, any uh, combination to, uh, to call on experts that are a part of that uh, multi-layered system to both diagnose and to provide some uh, direction for the um, <coughs> caregiver who would be here and maybe helping the older person to kind of figure out uh, what problem they have. Um, three six-person dementia clusters and a ten-person adult daycare center Again, located on the first floor, this is one, uh, the section of the atrium that it's uh, uh, connected to. This is what it would look like on the inside of these small uh, group clusters. So again, all of that's kind of integrated um, in one uh, place. So I've got five minutes here, so I do want to end so we have some conversation. Let's talk about the United States a little bit. This is a project I worked on in Woodlands, Texas. It was unfortunately not implemented. I did with Perkins Eastman, New York. And um, what we did was, um, this was one of these 2008 condo projects that crashed and burned with everything that crashed and burned with 2008. So it was, um, it was uh, developed, but it was developed actually as a conventional project later on because it was a great site. But what we did was to develop um, a series, and we didn't uh, implement them all. We had maybe 25 features that we utilized as the basis for our uh, um, our universal design uh, platform and then we had another 20 that were particularly relevant for people who were in wheelchairs and another uh, 
25 that were kind of wired for or behind the walls that could uh, could be implemented a little bit uh, later. And the whole total for the, all of the additions that we looked at, there were about 50 of them, uh, was uh, surprisingly uh, low. Uh, it wasn't really, didn't cost a lot. So uh, the other thing that you're seeing is that these kinds of apartments for life are being implemented in continuing care retirement communities as well. So this is uh, Newbridge on the Charles, which is the one of the newer um, projects that the uh, Hebrew Senior Life in Boston is doing. Uh, and you can see a huge project, uh, 600 units, 256 units of housing though, uh, with a K through eight private school as well, and 60,000 square feet of common space, so gigantic place, right? But again, open to people in the community as well. Um, and 182 units that are based on this apartments for life idea. So they built um, also a lot of long-term care because they were they, they were using uh, licenses that were uh, necessary for them to transfer. But their big idea was to say we want everyone to stay in the units, and we will fill the long-term care beds from with people from the outside. Now, if somebody wanted to move there, that's fine as well. But but part of the innovation of this project will be that we do, we use an apartment for life platform. And they've done that pretty effectively. Now this project opened in 2009. It's completely occupied, some standard kind of CCRC 90% uh, uh, refundable uh, unit and quite, quite pricey. It's in the half million to, to one million dollar range. But, you know, it's completely refundable as well. Um, last project, and I'll do this in two minutes, um, is um, I brought our little publication. This is my studio that I did last semester. And again, trying to get our students to think a little bit about housing for older people and also taking or pushing this uh, Apartments for Life idea a little bit further. This is our campus, pretty contained 50-acre campus in the middle of the city. Uh, there's a section of it that's likely to be, you know, for a billion dollars, that's going to be developed in the next uh, five years. Um, and so we picked a site that, that was about two uh, and a third acres. Uh, it's a parking lot now, and that the university didn't really think, uh, because it was separated with a parking garage and some, and, and some athletic facilities from the, from the core part of the campus, they thought it was great for us to do this. So we developed a, a program that included uh, 60 units of uh, of apartment for life, because 60 units is about the smallest number you can you can make, and it has to be in a way a multi-story building for for to gain the economies that are necessary by using an elevator instead of having people walk uh, uh, horizontally for um, great distances. But we include civic engagement, which is our program that uh, is connected with the surrounding community, our maritime center, and then an auditorium as well as uh, a coffee house and restaurant that we wanted to just. Uh, have as places where individuals could come. And this was for retired faculty and staff and current faculty and staff and for neighborhood residents and for alumni and for students as well. So the, the big idea was to, to be able to create this place where, where everybody could come together. And these are four of the most interesting uh, solutions that are kind of prototypical of ideas that the students develop. One's a kind of an edge scheme that wraps around with a big uh, with a big park in the middle of it. The other one uh, is aligned with Jefferson, which is the major street on the edge of this. The other two uh, create these uh, f more formal connections using the corner. All of them actually use the corner as a, a, as a gateway. Um, and then we did uh, an analysis. Uh, and here's, uh, here's a typical solution. Uh, housing in the corner. These are all these other components. The parking garage is here and then cutting through uh, to the rest of the campus would uh, occur through this parking garage as well, or adjacent parking garage. Um, so we also developed, I, I uh, created a series of project uh, uh, goals that I wanted the students to pay a special attention to, and there are 10 of them, and these are the ones that I thought were the most interesting, the idea of creating the adaptable unit. So we have um, a lot of work that we did in the past, and also work the students did uh, to look at how the units themselves could be changed over time. This notion of the gateway, how it would connect to the surrounding community, because across the street is, uh, is the uh, 
low-income community that we um, are adjacent to, and this big idea here was to figure out ways in which we could uh, invite people from that community on campus. We have about a hundred different programs that have been set up for people living in the surrounding community, and we've had them for 20 years. Um, we've had a very strong commitment to helping people in the nearby neighborhood. Uh, the idea of a gateway, uh, looking at the issue of sustainability, also the idea of walking and exercise. We really wanted people to, to have uh, options rather than just taking the elevator. So we looked for ways in which we could create routes where people could get up and down from their apartment. Um, walking, you know, really beautiful fire stairs as opposed to not so nice ones. Um, and the idea of security, because we are in a neighborhood that's not wonderful, and uh, there's a need for us to be able to close the whole building down at the end of the day. Uh, this idea of how to green up that corner of the campus, and of course this notion of social exchange. How can we create places where people will naturally come together and enjoy one another's company? All right, there you go. <laughs> Thank you. There will be huge numbers of people, and we aren't really very well prepared to deal with it. I mean, there are worse countries in the world. China, for example. If you go there, it's even worse than it is here. Uh, they are even more clueless than we are. But I think there's a really strong need for us to experiment more, and places like uh, the Midwest, especially this state and other states that are sparsely populated, have an obligation to think about uh, some of this electronic uh, uh, technology and how that could be coupled uh, in other ways because um, we don't want to have people moving 100 miles uh, to urban centers just because we aren't smart enough to figure out how to help them. So there's um, some really good and I think wonderful challenges in a context like this that can uh, be shared with a uh, broad range of people as well. So we, we do need more experimental work. Yes. Yes, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Thank you. I also traveled on a study abroad to Sweden and saw the similar kinds of uh, developments in Sweden and Finland. And that's kind of what has animated my interest in the project we're trying to do in Lawrence. Uh, I'm very interested in how the faculty uh, pay for this housing. Do they buy their own unit? Uh, that's a really good CCRC? question, by the way. Um, in, um, in Sweden and Denmark, not in Norway and not in Germany and not in, uh, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, almost all of it is provided by the government because you pay high taxes and so a big part of the, of the housing um, as well as the housing, hybrid housing with services is picked up. Uh, they have entitled long-term care, for example. But if you look at uh, the Dutch, it's very, they're more like us. And if you look at Norway, they're more like us. They have, they have less uh, obligation uh, to broader and uh, richer uh, umbrella social programs. And you do see really interesting things like condos and rental units and subsidized units all being kind of mixed together in a single development. Now the big difference is that in those uh, countries, 90 per, here 90 percent of the housing, maybe 95 percent of the housing is created by proprietary organizations, the Pultis and, and you know, uh, big uh, large providers of housing in, in the United States. There it's exactly the opposite. 90 percent to 95 percent are non-profit housing corporations, some of which are 200 years old. They've just been around for a long time. So. And much of the land is not owned by individuals, it's land, uh, land that's owned by the state. So if you decide you're going to do development, you're actually, you're actually working with um, a, a commune, a separate county, and you're kind of working out a deal. So a lot of the profit um, is, is pushed right back into the development of the project, and, uh, and there are many ways in which uh, uh, the state can raise the stakes all the time. So when I first started working there, they were much more generous, and now they're less generous because they see that there are greater cash flows that are coming off from these projects. More people are buying condos because they're more rich people in these countries, more so than they were in the past. So they can afford um, to uh, purchase equity-based housing, and when they do, they look for ways in which they can take advantage of that. And, and by the way, most of this housing is so unusual and it's so rare 
that the people that bought this in the very beginning have already paid for all their long-term care uh, because the actual appreciation of these units was far greater than the normal housing stock. So that's the other thing that probably could happen. If you develop something like this that had a really good system, it may become um, more valuable than normal housing stock. So who knows? But because there's been a raise uh, in the number of people that have disposable income, there are other uh, choices that are available in these countries than there, there were in 1955 you know, or whatever. Thank you for that very comprehensive answer. But I was asking, what are you doing at USC with that, you know, the unit oh. you just talked about? Well, this I did this. Uh, I got a grant from um, a local developer who did um, actually at low-income housing. And um, I pitched him this idea, and I... Uh, I just put it together so that we could show the uh, campus what the possibilities were. Oh, so that's not that's not reality yet. There's there's not faculty living. No, something it's a bunch like of drawings. It's all just okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we are we are we, so reality at USC is is kind of unreal because we're in the middle of our right. our fundraising campaign, which is six billion dollars. So I think we can build it with six billion, <laughs> maybe. I you know it's an easy thing to do if somebody said, oh gee, we need to do that. I was interested in whether people were actually going to be able to purchase those units because, like you, yeah. I saw that idea of purchasing the unit really working well, just just the way you described it. If we did it, I we haven't thought about it that way. But if we did it, USC, we'd probably do it on hundred-year lease land. We would, you know, we we it would never be a fee simple condo, but we could do that. The one I did before, I looked at the possibility of doing condos. Now, in northern in. The Netherlands very interesting because they build each of the housing units so that they meet the condo standard. So you can be renting a unit next to somebody who owns the unit, next to somebody who's renting a unit, next to two people that are owning a unit. Doesn't matter, right? They don't have condominium units uh, necessarily uh, on their own. Now these projects, the one I showed you, happen to have them all coalesce in one unit because they wanted to make the units bigger and stackable. But that's not actually the way it works in a lot of the communities. Uh, but you have the freedom of being able to purchase or, or rent. And there is a cost for renting, but then you can have part of that subsidized depending on what your income is as well. Yeah, so there's market rate, and then there's low market rate. So those systems are just a little bit more generous from, a, from a, uh, a housing policy and subsidy perspective as well. Yeah. My concern is how you make the market rate here in the U.S. economically feasible for the vast number of middle class baby boomers. I read recently that the average net worth of a baby boomer age 55 to 65, including their home equity, is about $170,000. Right. And I look at all of this and it's, it's great, wonderful, great concepts, great ideas. Right. But we don't have a system here, let alone that can afford to build them, except for the all right, the very rich, and then the subsidized. Yeah. And what about all those in between? How do we? Well, make, you're right. How I do mean, we make that's this a kind of thing accessible? Yeah, that is a problem. I think this idea of keeping people in their own home for as long as possible is a really good way of trying to um, try, trying to keep uh, as much income in the house and, and net worth uh, to the individual as possible. And we, you know, it, anyone who's been out there pricing assisted living knows that it's. You know, not unusual to pay between $150 and $300 a day for assisted living housing. I mean, it's possible, to, uh, depending on what your uh, what your um, cholesterol problems would likely be. So, if we had a if, if we had a system that was much more uh, realistic in a way more custom fitted to individuals' uh, needs, and and one that would also help a spouse as well, rather than dropping all of this burden on the spouse, help them at least to, uh, to have some external help and support for doing some things. There are lots of ways in which I think the system could be made more effective and uh, much more efficient. And that's something that I think is, is certainly possible. Uh, the, the, um, I, I just have found working with the Motion Picture Country house and TV group very interesting because most people think, oh, yeah, it's Jodie Foster. <laughs> well, yeah, Jodie Foster paid for their uh, swimming pool. And I don't know, it cost them 10 million or 15 million to, for her to do that. But the vast majority of people in that, um, in, in that group are people that were behind the cameras, 
uh, grips and you know all of these people that, did, that were middle class people, working class people that didn't make a lot of money, m many of which were living in rental housing all of their life. And so they're looking for ways in which they can try and figure out how to help those people live more independently for a longer period of time. So they don't want them to necessarily move on the campus because that's kind of an expensive alternative, especially if they can help them stay in the community on their own uh, with community services as well. They're Dial right. There are all kinds of community services that are available as well. So it's a good question. It's an excellent question. We know that if you if you look at that boomer literature, there are a third of the people that aren't going to have any problem. I don't care where the stock market goes. They're not going to have any problem. Then there are a third of the people, like like the group you described, that are going to live on Social Security. Good luck. Who knows what's going to happen? Hopefully, this first uh, cohort of boomers are going to be at least okay. Maybe not the next one. Uh, and then we have people of the third and the squishy middle, right, uh, between the top and the bottom, that it will depend on the market. It will depend on housing equity. It will depend on, on a lot of the things that happen in society, whether or not they have the wealth uh, to live um, you know, a good life, or they're going to have to continue to work until they're 75. Who knows? But you're right. We certainly need to tell people to save money in this country, because if they don't do that, no one else is going to do it for them. And we need to deliver that message uh, to all the young people, too, so that they start thinking that way. Yeah? Do you have a sense of the dollar amount for remodeling to keep people in their home? Well, it kind of depends. You know, if you go to Japan, you find that there are a lot of 30-inch quarters, right? <laughs> so that's a big problem. It's hard to move a quarter wall. But, um, and if you look at housing that was done after the Second World War, there are a lot of 24-inch doors and a lot of 28-inch doors. So those are pretty hard to, to change, too. You can take the door off. You can even take all the trim off, and it's still not wide enough, right? So uh, much of it kind of depends on the scope of the, uh, the particular dwelling unit that you're working with. Now, the irony is that if you make the decision, oh, we're going to put all... 32 inch doors in or 36 inch doors because a 32 and a 36 inch door worth almost the same amount, right? Pennies of difference between the two. Right? So if you're putting a big door in to begin with, it's like, okay, we solve the problem. We don't have to worry about that. We'll take the door off if we want or put offset set hinges on. We can do anything. We can really fix it. Now, sometimes you can, um, sometimes you can say, why do you have such a big wheelchair? Maybe you can get a smaller wheelchair that makes it a little easier for the individual to get from place to place. And sometimes that works, too, uh, because it doesn't have to be some uh, behemoth uh, wheelchair to get people around. So there, uh, sometimes we will suggest that people uh, move to a, a jerry chair because they're much narrower. Sometimes you can find them 24 inches wide, and you can get through a doorway with that kind of chair where you couldn't in a ever get through that same doorway uh, with a normal wheelchair. So there are many different strategies and approaches that can be utilized to look at the problem and kind of think about it. A lot of multi-story housing, people just move to the first floor, and that's it. That's how they, if you look at most of the uh, housing, two-story housing that's being developed in a, active adult communities, it's uh, master bedroom down is what they call it. So you have at least one uh, fully accessible bedroom on the first floor, even though you might have two or, or more bedrooms up above if it's a huge uh, uh, house. So that's a good question, but it just depends a great deal on the context. And uh, it could be a lot or it could be a small amount, depending on how much change you want to make. Like, for example, uh, we often will go into a kitchen and say, uh, uh, placing an interim shelf, if, there, if there's 20 inches between the cabinet, the lower portion of the cabinet and the upper portion of the lower cabinet, good enough to put an interim shelf, that can solve lots of problems for people. They don't have to put in fancy cabinetry, they don't have to put in rollouts, they don't have to put a lot of things in. Or if we have a wall that we can hang something on, uh, we can put pots and things like that on it that weigh a lot rather than something that they have to fish for underneath the, uh, underneath the counter. So a lot of it depends on you know, how you approach the problem and what the nature of the uh, uh, problem is like. Good question. Though. Others? What do we need to do to make it happen, to make this a reality in the United States? Is it uh, policy? Is it uh, zoning? Is it giving to the developers? Yeah, it's everything. It's everything. 
Yeah, we have to, first of all, these are very difficult to get approved because we have a system where um, assisted living and nursing is, uh, is licensed together with a building type, right? Mm -hmm. So you can't just take any building. You have to have a, a type one building or you have an eye occupancy building if you want to build assisted living, for example, it has to meet all these standards. And um, same thing with nursing uh, as well. So sometimes the building type and the purpose of the building are intertwined to the point where it really is very difficult to do. Now, if somebody says, well, okay, I'm going to live in that high-rise building down the street, and it, it works for me, and I'm going to have somebody come in and help me, they're not going to arrest me, right? Mm -hmm. Even though that building may not even have sprinklers or whatever. It might really be an old building that's not so good. I shouldn't even move into it because I, if I knew better, I wouldn't. But, but the point is that that would be okay. But if, they're, if what they're doing is trying to sanction this, mm -hmm. it's a whole different kind of picture. So you, you kind of need to have the, you need to have the people who are making these approvals at the state level sitting at the same table as the developers and as the sponsors and all talking about how are we going to solve these problems and how are we going to resolve. It's, it's interesting, if you look at the team approaches that take place in the Netherlands, it's almost always a builder with a service provider, sponsor. And, and there are very few people that can build and provide services that know both those worlds, right? It's kind of unusual. So if you can find one person that knows how to build and another person who knows how to provide the services, and they can work together, and along with the person who's regulating this can see the benefit of this, or can place uh, the kind of uh, constraints that are necessary to make it implementable and safe, then you've got it made. But, but a lot of innovation actually in assisted living and nursing has taken place that way. It's all taken place on a single project basis where somebody was willing to take the risk. And sometimes that's complicated too because you do something that no one else has done before and of course another you know, problem with our society is we have too many lawyers and they are looking for ways to say, well, you didn't do this. Well, we agreed not to do that. Well, it doesn't matter. You didn't do it. And so because you didn't do it, you have a kind of uh, liability that's there. So sometimes Trying to do the right thing doesn't work either. So it's complicated and difficult in this country to do a lot of things. And I always think if we, you know, if we treated cell phones the way we treat housing for older people, we'd all be using those big mob bell pounds. <laughs> <laughs> Weighs 22 pounds, you know, plugged into the wall phones. It's because we wouldn't allow it to innovate in the same way. So we're, we're, we're not so good here when it comes to this uh, issue, but it is a big issue and it's going to cost a lot and it's going to affect people and we really have to think differently. Yeah? Well, and kind of an answer to the gentleman that asked about the, uh, the boomers that may not be at the upper end or the lower end. Of the right. Town. There's a village organizing hair laws based on the, the vegan hair model. Mm -hmm. It's just in its infancy, but if anybody's interested in that model, we're having our next public meeting November the 17th at Fire Station 5. I think it's they're great. I mean, my experience. I've been working with three of them in Santa Monica, and the big problem is you you need to have uh, somebody who's going to sit at the table and is going to be there, rather than just a group of uh, individuals that are showing up wanting to do good things. Uh, so we have uh, we have a group at Santa Monica uh, called uh, Wise. And it's uh, the Westside Independent Services uh, group. And uh, those guys have chosen to support this and to provide the kind of public infrastructure. And they've also tapped very effectively into United Way funding, which is not something that a lot of people have been able to do. They, this is something United Way should really do, but they don't in many other places. And that provides enough money to assemble the right people and to have um, you know enough resiliency that you can you can actually launch something without worrying every week whether or not you're going to be able to pay the bills. So um, a lot of um, a lot of thinking is taking place in that domain. And of course, you probably know because you're involved in it. Uh, they're having these yearly meetings and sometimes a, a couple of times a year of other people like yourself who are all trying to share their own dilemmas and and their own ideas and they're oh we got around that by doing this uh, kind of thing. In, in, uh, in the Netherlands, most of the, the, uh, the one that I, I showed you, that system that I showed you, um, was uh, an obligation that was dropped on uh, the housing provider. 
course, they have they don't have a hundred housing providers. They have two or three nonprofit gigantic housing providers, and they just said, "You guys ought to fund this. This is really important for you to help all of these people." And so they were able to do that. And of course, all their funding is the vetting, and they're not paying for any of the services. They're negotiating the discounts and they're doing the vetting. But that by itself is a big deal, and it really does help. Uh, and people don't find themselves in in trouble uh, by picking some uh, individual that, uh, you know, is, is not going to be uh, a good person. So um, all of these things are important, but, you know, that it still is a problem. If, you, if you're paying for home care and you can't afford home care, a 10% discount is going to do you a whole lot of good. I mean, it's 10% less than what the, what the total amount is. Yes? Okay. Uh, at least for this hour, uh, I invite anyone who's interested to come back at 3 for a seminar. We'll set this up for a seminar. Or stay around the morning at 10 o'clock. Uh, it should probably go on a long time, but I know that you're busy, and uh, we appreciate very much, Victor, for coming all the way from California. My pleasure. I'm going to go over maybe about a half a dozen models of university affiliated housing arrangements. So we'll look at what other universities have done in conjunction with housing sponsors to work out a deal so that they could either pro provide the land or and then look at the exchanges that take place between those entities, uh, partly because that's uh, yeah, an important part of the problem. You've got to figure out what. Uh, what, what, how it's going to help both groups uh, in order to get really excellent cooperation. So, anyway. okay, thanks, everybody, for coming. Appreciate it.